Yeah, thank you. I knew it was an L. I was like, what's this girl's name? Okay, so she doesn't go to our church right now, but um, there's a change what's real in the spirit, you know what I'm saying? So she's pregnant. Lydia, some of you know Lydia. And um, August 23rd, I waited to tell you this testimony. She said, Here the, hey there, you busy? Wanted to share something with you. Actually, let me send a voice note. So I'm going to try to let you hear this voice note, okay? Can you just be quiet? And <laughs> you got to quiet now, but listen to this. Hey there. So I just wanted to share this with you because it's like, I know that you know, but I just need you to know, no, 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 no. The level of just impact and influence you have on each and every one of us. So the other day, yesterday actually, I went to DR... Um, and I came back Monday evening, and so yesterday I had my follow-up appointments. I had a sign appointment, and um, 33 weeks now, so they do the sign appointment. Um, the baby's growing, everything's looking good, the baby's five pounds, four ounces now, and they were like, but baby is butt down this time, so weird, because the baby was face down, which is the position they need to be in at your last appointment. So she, he was, she was like, everything looks good, placenta fluid and everything looks good. We're going to send the doctor in to just kind of review everything with you. So the doctor comes in and he's like, yeah, everything looks good, but I just can't understand why the baby would turn the other direction now. Um, but, you know, I'll see you in three weeks. You know, we want the baby to turn because if not, they're going to start talking to you about a C-section. And obviously, that's not what I want. So, of course, in my head, I'm like, oh, my goodness. So, I'm like, that's not at all it. So, I start Googling, literally. I start Googling ways to get the baby to turn naturally. And I promise you, I heard your voice clear as day. The baby will turn in Jesus' name, period. And I closed my phone, and I was like, yes. And I just came into agreement with your voice that I heard. The baby will turn in Jesus' name, period. There's nothing else for you to do. There's no, not, there's nothing to look up. You want to know how the baby's going to turn? The baby will turn in Jesus' name, period. Like, that's literally what I heard you say. And it was your voice. Like, it was crazy. But I just have to share that with you because I need you to know just the level of impact that you have. And I'm so grateful. Um, I'm just grateful for you. And that's it. All right, have a good day. Amen. Amen. September 7th, 3.47 p.m. And the baby turned. Amen and amen. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? She said, the way God continues to show himself as a life lesson for me in and of itself, I am mm, about to cry, man. I am so grateful. All honor and praise. Oh, I didn't even realize she said this. <laughs> That's why you have to do it. You're smart. All honor and praise. He is so faithful. I didn't remember this part. And this leads me into our new series. We're going to talk about over the next few weeks the dynamic character of God. The dynamic character of God. Or God's dynamic character. And my assignment for today, and we're going to see whatever the Holy Spirit does, who he has, I don't think I'm going to do all of it. Um, I'm here to talk about the fierce loyalty of God. Somebody say the fierce, fierce. loyalty of of God. Somebody say, God is loyal. God is faithful. God is loyal. God is faithful. Amen. The word fierce, and I'm going to need you to take notes in this season of these lessons because I want you to really be taught and fed this word that we're going to give you that the Father wants you to have. The word fierce is defined as having 
or displaying an intense or ferocious, ferocious aggressiveness. Having or displaying an intense or ferocious aggressiveness. Showing, second definition, showing a heartfelt and powerful intensity. So when I say that God is fiercely loyal, I'm saying to you that God is showing you a heartfelt and powerful intensity. I'm saying that God is displaying an intense and ferocious aggressiveness when it comes to you. Amen. Because the word faithful, we're going to talk about the word because we really we, we're talking about the radical faithfulness of God. But sometimes when you say God is faithful, people are like, oh, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> but when you really break out what it really means to be faithful and it means to be fiercely loyal and God is fiercely loyal. It's not just some nonchalant faithfulness that God has towards you. He has a fierce loyalty to you. Then you'll understand why he is the way he is on other matters. Why he has a problem with you not giving 10%. When I told you have the 90, but give me my 10%. There's a problem if I'm that loyal to you and you won't even give 10% that I allowed you to have. Or why you can't keep yourself when, I'm, when I've given you the body that you actually have, when I have so many great plans for you and I've already shown you so many good things, why can't you keep yourself as a faithful one to your father? Amen. Write this down. We're talking about the fierce loyalty of God. God is so loyal that he gives you new mercies every morning. Turn with me to Lamentations in your phones. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. But the point number one is God is so loyal that he gives you new mercies every morning. All of us can testify that we've experienced the mercy of God. The word mercy means compassion, the pity of God. And in verse 22, it says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Does anybody know what the word consumed means? Does anybody know what the word consumed means? <laughs> I'm going to teach you, you know, to this girl eating a sandwich in my face. Jesus, only in Winners Church. Does anybody know what it means to devour it? Anybody else? Consumed? Overtaken? Taken over, you said? And what'd you say? Taken over, yeah. Consumed, got Sister Valme? Burned, I like that. When you think about a consume, it means that you're burnt up. So you're like a fire starts in a house and it consumes the house. It takes over the whole house, like you guys said. And it burns it up. And all that's left is what? Ashes. So the Bible is saying that if it wasn't for God's mercies, we, our lives would be ashes. We would be consumed. We would be done for. But the mercy of God has kept us. Amen? You are alive today because of the mercy of God. You are here today because of the mercy of God. You know, there are some car accidents like a fender bender, but there's some horrific car accidents where people said people's heads have been decapitated. Um, Pastor Creflo Dollar just gave a testimony um, recently I saw on television where he was in a car accident many, many years ago. I think he said 2001 or 2002. I don't remember which one, what actual year, but he was on his way to um, Philip, Pastor Philip Godot's church in Sacramento, California. He had, he had, you know, flew there and he was going to preach at the mega church in California, Calvary Christian Center. Him, um, one of his staff people and somebody else, there's three people on the way to the church. And it's interesting, his, his son, really his adopted son, he was going to come on this trip. For some reason, he said, I kept saying, you're not ready for this trip. Your body won't be able to handle this trip. And he didn't know why he was saying it, but then he realized why later. <laughs> and um, so there somehow somebody, 
sideswipe them or hit them in a way where their car, um, the car crash was so bad it tumbled over the, one of the guys, his, one of his guys, his assistant for the church flew out the window into the window shield of the other car. Creflo and the other guy, they were still in the car. He said that um, when it was tumbling, I forgot what he said. I don't know if he said Jesus or old God. He said, he literally said, you're going to have to believe this. But I saw two angels. I saw their face go right by. And they all lived. The emergency people said, the, uh, or the firefighters said, don't even call the ambulance. No, or no one survived. We've no, based on what we've heard, no one is alive in that, in that thing. All of them lived. The guy who went through the windshield, he was okay. He said, are you? He says, I'm fine. I'm fine. I think he had just like one little scratch or something. I'm fine. He said, yo, when the car was tumbling, he said, Pastor, before you even tell me, I know what you're going to say. He says, what do I want to say? You saw two angels. He said, I saw them too. My Lord. He's faithful. It is of his mercies that we're not consumed. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? It says... Because his, it says, watch this, because his compassions fail not. His compassion towards his children, towards his people, does not fail. And then verse 23 says, they are new every what? Morning. Great is your what? Great is your what? No, guys, are you reading with me? Verse 23? Read the scripture with me. They are new every morning. Great is your what? Faithfulness, your fierce loyalty. He was fiercely loyal to Creflo and to those other two men. They didn't lose a father. They didn't lose another preacher. And he said he got himself together and he went ahead and preached. Thank you, Jesus. No broken bones. No heads decapitated. I had a, a, I have a cousin who does volunteer, or I don't know if he still does it, does volunteer work with the firefighters in Long Island. And he said, yo, one time um, there was a guy with a motorcycle um, crash right on the Belt Parkway. I think he said his whole, either his head was cut off or his whole face was ripped off. When Satan, and because accidents like that are the devil, when Satan does it, he hates you and he wants to destroy you. He wants to really make you suffer. But the good news, we have a God who is faithful, amen? amen, who will keep us and protect us. And we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faith. You get brand new mercies every morning. Father, I, I messed up last night. Okay, you messed up last night. Good morning. New mercy. I messed up last week. Good morning. New week. I messed up last month. Good morning, new month. I really messed up in the whole year. Good morning, happy new year. <laughs> I messed up the last five years. Okay, yeah, you was really dragging it. But good, <laughs> good half a decade. <laughs> you know, because some of you know you've been dragging it with Jesus. And he's like, Father? And the Father's like, my blood, my, okay. God is loyal. Number two, he's faithful to forgive you. The Bible says if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. That's what the Bible says. When I grew up, my mother didn't like us saying the word liar. She said, say fibber. And I was like, no, if somebody's lied, they lied. Fibber, fib. There's such a thing as a fib or fibber. Because people don't like that. But that's God likes it. You are a liar. <laughs> you lied. You didn't tell the truth. 
Now, I know parents sometimes they don't want their kids telling their siblings you're a liar. I, know, I don't know why that is, but yo, I, if I had kids, I'd say, yeah, call your brother a liar. If he's a liar, he's a liar. You're a liar! <laughs> God is so real and so full of truth, he absolutely will not make believe something is not. He may cover your sin. The Bible says love covers a multiple of sins, but I'm not going to say something is not. And we have to be like him. Not like our culture, not like how we were raised or told to be. We have to be like him. So if you're a liar, you're a liar. Amen. You don't have to always be a liar, but if that's what you are, that's what you are. Amen. Hello, ladies. If you're a man liar, you're going to say, oh, you're a fibber. You're going to say what? Oh, you, we know how y'all do. We've seen all the reality shows. You're a liar. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But God says, if, because you don't have to sin. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we sin, I mean, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we what? confess our sins he is what faithful fiercely loyal and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the bible says that god is ready to forgive so no matter what you've done wrong god wants to forgive you he's not reluctant to forgive you i love forgiving my people i love forgiving my sons and daughters i don't want you to live in sin i don't want you to continue to go down a carnal pathway but i love to forgive I'm ready to forgive. I'm slow to anger. But you have to do something. You have to confess. Now, what does the word confess mean? It comes from a Greek word that literally means to say the same thing as. The word confess means to say the same thing as. So, this is how you confess your sins. This is Christianity 101. Let's say you stole something from somebody. You would say, Father, yesterday I stole $100 from my parents. You're confessing your sins. I'm sorry. It is wrong. It is a sin. It's against your word. It's against your principles. Whatever you're going to say, forgive me for my sins. God will forgive you. Now, should you tell your parents that you stole $100? Sure should. Will they kill you? Maybe. <laughs> but God has forgiven you. <laughs> will they forgive you? I don't know. But God has forgiven you. But God will want you to go back and restore back what you have stolen. OK. The reason why I use that example, because that's a sin against someone. Now we have personal sins. Lord, I was watching porn last night. I wasn't, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Forgive me for watching porn. Forgive me for masturbating. And this goes for men and women. Because both genders do it. Forgive me for that. That is evil, is wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a work of the flesh. And, and I know that I was inspired by Satan to do it. So forgive me for that. And cleanse me. And what will God do? He will forgive you. And he will what? Cleanse you. Simple as that. Everybody understand now how to receive forgiveness from God? You can't just feel sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry that I, that I watched the porn. Oh, and you're crying. Okay, that still doesn't mean anything. I'm glad that you have godly sorrow, but godly sorrow is not confession. You know why God wants you to confess it? Because he wants you to come face to face with yourself. Your confession is like a mirror. Your confession is saying, I'm honest, and I want to be honest. If I don't want to be honest, you require me to be honest, so I'm going to be honest. The Bible says in the book of I think it's Proverbs in the Old Testament. He who confesses and forsakes his sin 
will have mercy. See, the purpose of confession is to get you to also forsake. Not to use 1 John 1, 9 as a little soap bar and you still go back and do the thing the next time. Now, I know that all of us have done that. I'm sorry, Lord, and go back and do the same thing. God knows that you was going to do that. That's why verse 7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all your sin. Continually cleansing. Because <laughs> he knows some of you are on repeat for your sins. <laughs> but it comes a time in your life where you have to stop the repeat button and push pause and say, I'm living a sanctified and holy life. Amen? Amen? But God will love you and forgive you until you get to that place. Now, old school Pentecostals are like, no, you're going to hell. <laughs> we told you to stop. You didn't stop. You're going. No, your salvation is not based on what some preacher feels is the limit of your sin. Because trust me, never mind. God is more kind, more loving than what some preachers have portrayed. Now, I will say this. I don't always tell you guys everything. You think I tell you everything. I don't. A prophet had a dream about when his church. Real prophet of God. And so I had a dream and I saw that... Um, you're giving the people a lot of candy. This is many years ago. Which means that he was saying that I wasn't giving you some of the other hard parts of God. I meditated upon it. I said, he's kind of right. So, if you see me personally come to you or preaching from the pulpit some hard part please don't be like oh I don't want to hear that because you'll be a fool because if you have a pastor who's looking to be gracious looking to be merciful and a prophet has to tell him you have to add the other part you should be happy you're in this church amen and also if you don't want to hear the hard part the part of holiness and righteousness now, we're going to focus on the, faith, the, the faithfulness of God today, but I'm trying to just add this part. You're going to develop what the Bible condemns, and it's called itching ears. The Bible says in the last days, men will have itching ears. He wasn't talking about the world. He's talking about the church. You know, itching ears? My ears itching. Ah, I don't want to hear that. Ah, I don't want to hear that. And with the media, social media, it's very easy to have itching ears. Somebody saying something you don't like? Click. <laughs> Back in the day, you couldn't do that. <laughs> Somebody say, Lord, I don't want itching ears. Because what happens is if you have itching ears, you're going to keep hearing the wrong thing, and then you'll get into deception, and your deception will lead you into ruin. Some things in the Word of God are a little tough. Some things are a little challenging but you must accept it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, children, obey your parents in the Lord. I don't think they're right. I don't think they know what they're talking about. It don't make a difference what you think. The Bible says obey your parents. Honor your mother and father. I don't want to honor them. They're bums. <laughs> and some parents have been bums. Most parents are not, but there are a lot that are. Terrible parents. The Bible says still honor them. It doesn't say that you have to be their best friend. It just says honor them. Amen. Hallelujah. Live holy because I am holy. We'll talk about that later. The characteristic of God, God is holy. Don't have sex before you're married. Uh, I, no, there's no ah. Uh, obey me. I'm God. I could kill you. I'm not going to, but I could. Jesus said to the disciples, he says, you're worried about these religious leaders who are persecuting you, bothering you. He says, don't be worried about those guys. Don't be afraid of them. Fear God who can kill both body and soul in hell. That's who you should fear. 
We'll talk about that some other time. The fear of the Lord is real. Anybody remember the book of Acts? When the first church, the, the church first started and the devil wanted to bring corruption to the church? And the people sold their stuff and brought the money to the apostles and then lied about how much money they, they're giving. Oh, yeah, we sold everything. Here's all the money to the glory of God. And Peter said, why? To the husband first. Why have you let Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And he dropped dead right there. Thank God we ain't dropping dead. Because some of y'all would have been dropping dead. It would be, this church would have been super empty. Me and Pastor Patrick and Pastor Fabius. Hey guys, maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's just a vow, man. Yeah, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. He dropped dead. They carry his body out. They literally carry his body out to service and buried him. Because remember, they're Jewish, so you bury right away. They don't wait for no, no uh, what's the thing called? When they take the blood out of you, all that stuff? And no embalming. Embal embalming. Bury him. Goodbye. Remember, don't call his mom, don't call his dad. Bury him. Wife comes in. He says, hey. Peter says, gives her a chance to tell the truth. Did you sell this for this amount? This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, you've joined your husband in this deception. I'm paraphrasing. He says, the same men that took your husband out will take you out. <laughs> Boom, she dropped dead. Some preachers who preach grace don't like that scripture. And they say they were sinners. That's not true. Why would Peter tell a sinner, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? He's a liar. <laughs> he ain't supposed to tell the truth. He's a sinner. These were Christians who were trying to play God. And the church just started. I can't have a church corrupted and it just started. You're dead. The Bible says fear came upon the whole church. Now, why am I saying this? Because even though I'm talking to you about the fierce loyalty of God, the fierce loyalty of God doesn't negate his holiness. And the church goes into revival. You have all this prophetic and all the glory, all the signs and wonders. You think you're going to have all of that and not have the fierce holiness of God coming upon the church? You can forget it. There's no revival without his holiness. There is no revival without us. You can't be on fire for God and ignore his holiness. It will never happen. Never. You'll have a few goosebumps, a few little things happen, but you'll be back into your carnality. It's impossible to have revival continue in your life without holiness. I don't care who you are. You could be the preacher, you could be an apostle, you could be a prophet. It don't make a difference. Todd Billy himself went through a lot of crazy stuff and a lot of judgment because of the lack of holiness in one portion of his life. He lost a lot. You guys don't really know him. He was one of the most premier evangelists. He probably would have been world renowned by now. Because of some sin in his life, he lost a lot of influence. It don't make a difference who you are. You're going to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. If you live in consistent sin, you will lose everything. Ask Eddie Long, who had a church of 25,000 members, had Martin Luther King's daughter on his staff. What an honor. He lost it all because he didn't deal with sin in his life. He was married, had kids, and still didn't deal with his secret sins, and he came crashing down. Schools closed down, money lost, influence gone. It doesn't make a difference who you are. Now, theirs are just public because they're public people, but there's private people in private who are falling and crashing because they refuse the holiness of God. And I'm encouraging you, in the name of Jesus, live holy lives. Don't dismiss holiness because God is so good and merciful. Amen? Ooh, that was tight, but it was right. <laughs> All right. Number three. God is so loyal. I'm going to say that one for later. God is so loyal, you cannot be tempted beyond your ability to overcome it. 
You cannot be tempted beyond your ability to overcome it. Lord, that was a great segue. I didn't even see how he was doing that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So Pastor Maurice had just said, I got to live holy by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is so faithful, you cannot be tempted above your ability to overcome it. How many of you know that we're all tempted? Married, single, make a difference who you are, male, female, kid, adult, teenager, everybody is tempted. You cannot be on a planet and not be tempted. You're tempted, right? Christopher? Yeah. <laughs> Yo, this guy was having a good time at that party yesterday, man. Dancing. My sister said, Yo, Christopher trying to be a little thug. <laughs> you have fun, right? I love it. I love your confidence is building strong and strong. And even though nobody was on the floor dancing, you were still dancing. I love that. Keep living like that. Keep dancing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He's, this guy, his heart is full of gold. Amen. His parents have, have raised an amazing seed in the earth. So we're all tempted, even children. What you have to do is place temptation in its proper place. And this is what it says. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So you know what God is saying? Don't come to me and tell me, oh, I can't, I can't, I, I can't. Stop it. You're lying to yourself. Everybody is tempted. Everybody wants to get down. Even Pastor Maurice wanted to blow somebody up before. I told you, the, oh, yo, I told you the story. I, yeah, I did tell you this, but I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> Me and Pastor Patrick was at Green Acres Mall on lunch break. We went to the Wendy's. This is years ago. And he got the table. I got the food. So I was carrying the food back to the table. And I had a big drink on, in the tray. And as I'm walking, I see this guy sitting there. He didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I was just walking to my table. And this thought came, a strong thought, with a picture. Take, take that drink and smash it on his head. I chuckled. I said, oh, my God, the devil is alive. And we sat down. I didn't even, and I said, oh, my goodness, this is what sinners go through. No, I, there, was, there was no reason for me to do it. It was just weird. No, it was just weird for me to, to have that thought. No, I knew it was an outside thought. I knew it wasn't me. No, I want to eat my food. <laughs> I'm not thinking about smashing a drink over somebody's head. You would want to if somebody did something to you. There's no, there's no need to want to. It was a random thought. It was a demonic thought. It was a thought of violence. And I realized that's in the atmosphere. That's why you say kids, kids punching people for no reason. Why are you punching somebody on the street for no reason? An old lady, demonic, and demons are sending thoughts in the atmosphere. That's why you have to capture that thought and say, Negro, please, goodbye. You got to do that. But you can't just do that with stuff that's a, that you know, okay, I don't do that. You have to do that with even the things that your flesh likes. That's what becomes tougher. I'll give you another story. One day I was visiting my dad in Kansas. He's a Muslim for now. And um, he had a one bedroom at the time, a one bedroom apartment. And he was like, I surprised him. You know, I was coming. He said, sleep in my room. I said, no, nah, I sleep on the couch. I just, he said, no, nah, I sleep in the room. You know, he's, <laughs> he's probably <laughs> stubbornness. That's what he is. <laughs> my mother said, you stubborn just like your dad, all my growing up. And so I said, okay. I went in his room, mad closed room. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I'm laying in his bed and, um, I don't know if it was the morning or the night, this floating thought and, and a feeling came with it. Why don't you become a Muslim? Now, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the nigger please was about to come up. <laughs> I wasn't using that word at the time. I was like, what? Like, what? Are you crazy? And then it, went. I didn't have to say the name of Jesus, goodbye. I was like, are you? The, the spirit was testing me, tempting me. 
Oh, you're with your dad, the young man who has then grown up with a dad. Maybe he wants to be connected to his dad. Let's see. I'm like, are you crazy? That was definitely a, one of those weak little principalities. Because that was like a weak temptation. But it still was a temptation. And people go through this all the time. This is why we have a rise in homosexuality and lesbianism with people who are really straight. But uh, just they're, they're in a hurt situation. And the feeling goes, why don't you just get with some women? Aren't you tired of men? And it comes through their mind. And it comes with a feeling. And then people become lesbians. I've seen people who become lesbians. I said, girl, you ain't no lesbian. Three years later, they're back to men. <laughs> they were hurt. But guess what? There's some men like that too. I don't know, in our culture, no. Once you did it, that's it. You're gay. <laughs> no, there's some people who are really straight and they have a pain. Men have pains too. And they enter into something. Oh, why don't you just stay with men, man? These, these women are whack. They, they hurting you. They're doing, taking your money. And people enter into that. People do this for drugs. We always, people say, oh, how can you become a drug addict? I can never become a drug addict. Even in the drug game, even you see it in the movies, there's like a, a disdain if you sell drugs and you're taking your own product. Like this pride. How dare you take your own product? Well, everybody is tempted, even drug dealers. So some drug dealers are going to take their product because they have pain in their life. The image is if you're a drug dealer, you ain't supposed to have no pain. You're going to be tough and rough and just be using everybody else and making that money, making that bread. You know, everybody has pain. And sometimes even a drug dealer will take his own stuff or people who do take drugs who wouldn't never take a drug. Lawyers, doctors, different people, they take it because there's a pain they haven't dealt with and they think the drug is going to inoculate the pain. It does for a moment, but you, the problem is still there. People get high, keep getting high because they don't want to deal with their pain. If you were raised now, I didn't raise any of you, but in Winners Church, if you tap in, like Lydia has tapped in to what's happening, there's a spirit of strength on this house. Amen. People will come here, get strong. Hallelujah. They eat good and they get strong. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. They get strong. You, there's a weakness that dissipates if they tap in. If your parents didn't raise you to be a strong person and to confront pain and to deal with your pain of your heart, I'm sorry for that but you're going to have to deal with it or you're going to give in to things you shouldn't be giving yourself into relationships, substances, whatever it is, you're going to give yourself over to it because of the pain of your heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let Jesus heal your heart, get strong or acknowledge, yo, I got some deep pain. I'm not over it yet, but I'm not gonna let this pain consume me and take over my life and give me to do things I shouldn't do. Amen. Amen. All right. No temptation has taken you except such as is common to men. But God is what? What does it say, guys? Read it. But everybody, one, two, three. But God is faithful. I hope you're turning to it. First Corinthians 10, 13. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He won't allow it. His faithfulness, his loyalty to, you, loyalty to you won't allow it. So Satan, the wicked spirits in the heavenly places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the principalities and the powers cannot bring you some cosmic temptation that overwhelms you and you just fall for it. No. The Bible says that God has literally put a limit in the spirit world on the demonic realm when it comes to you and temptation. He has to allow the temptation because they are, Satan is the god of this world. Satan gave him the earth's lease. But he, because he is God, he can put a limit on the temptation. So the only thing you can do is what everybody gets. Nothing on a super duper natural level. No, 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 no. It's common to you. And then he says, but with the temptation, will also make a way of escape. So not only does he put a limit on the temptation that you can experience, he also says, because I'm God, here's a way of escape. Run. <laughs> Run. Notice he said the way of escape. When you think of escape, you think of running. When you're escaping, you're not just like, okay. 
He's like, yo, I'm out of here. Run. Flee fornication. Run. Run from the devil. Run from the flesh. Run! Two people are hanging out. Woo! This is a nice temptation. Interesting. Nice colors. And then they're caught in the trap. Also, I'm going to finish this. You have to be honest with yourself. One day the Lord told me, stop like being weak. Ooh, that's heavy. Some people like being weak. They like lusting. They love cheating. They love selling drugs. I know I have to do drugs. I know I can make money another way, but I love selling drugs. I love the adrenaline rush that comes from being a criminal. How do you know that this is true? Jesus himself said it. He said in John 3.17, that's a verse you need to know. Everybody knows 3.16, no 17. For the Son of God did not come to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. And then he said, I think it's verse 18, and those who don't really come to me is because they love the darkness. They love the darkness. You have to be able to, as a son of God, daughter of God, you're not in darkness no more, you're in the light, but you have to be able to say whether or not there's something you love. Because there's some part of darkness that sometimes our flesh likes. I like watching porn. I like using dildos. Sorry for being crass. That's just the, yeah, he said, oh my God, he just asked, what is that? Lord have mercy, I forgot. I, I, God have mercy. I like going to foreign nations and foreign people to have sex with. I like it. I like stealing money from my corporate job. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm just talking about sins that is in our community. I'm talking about things that I like hacking. I like it. That's a sin. It's a crime. I like stealing from the government, government secrets. I like exposing the government. I like it. I like oppressing people. I like having slaves. People all over this world have slaves. Did you know slavery is not over? Just because American slavery is over doesn't mean that slavery is over. Slavery is all around the world. Go look up slavery around the world. You blow your mind. How many slaves are in China and India? And not just sex slaves. Talk about people who are slaves, like how American slaves, they're working. Making them work. Making kids work. Making people work. Who are poor. I like oppressing people. Demonic to the core. I like being a pimp. I like working the polls. I'm not working the polls because I have to. I just don't want to do the nine to five job. I want to work the polls. I want to show my breasts and my butt and I want to work it and get those tips. I like getting drunk. So if there's something you like that you're being tempted with, say, God, I actually like it. Deliver me from liking it. Deliver me from wanting it. Take the want to away. Amen? Amen? All right. You're a little quiet. I'm sorry. He's still faithful to you. <laughs> and he will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So there's always a way out of sin. Somebody say always. always. You don't have to. Always a way out. But if you do, confess it. He will forgive you and he will cleanse you. Number four. God is faithful so faithful, he will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Second Thessalon Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Now, isn't it interesting that this is what Jesus said to pray in the prayer? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth, as it is in heaven, give us this day our what? Daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from what? Evil. From evil. You know, other translation says, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the what? Evil one. Satan is the evil one. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy from you. <laughs> What's the three modes of the devil? Kill, steal, and destroy. You find that in John 10, 10. Kill, steal, and destroy. So if you see any killing, any destroying, 
any stealing in your life, know that it's the devil. Stealing, killing, and destroying. Not always literal killing, not always literal stealing, not always literal destroying. Means that things in your life, your job stolen from you, your spouse stolen from you, your kids stolen from you. Joy killed in your life. Peace stolen from you. All that is the work of the, uh, of the devil. And it also manifests in the, li in, in the literal. This is one of the reasons why you guys are standing today. Why you don't have a lot of tragedy in your life. Because of what we speak over this house. What we preach in this house. And we stand against the stealing, the killing, and the um, destroying of Satan. Many of you are standing today because of our prayers. Me, Pastor Patrick, Pastor, Pastor Samantha, Pastor Fabian, Pastor Michelle, crying out, mercy on the house. Sometimes God will flash some of you before me, and I begin to pray at home over your life. Same thing happens with all these pastors. You're in a good house, because some pastors, this is all a, a professional job. Yo, I preach a little word to you, give me my money, we good. <laughs> I don't care how you live, I don't care what happens to you. And you see mad people dying, cancer, dying of this, tragic this, tragic that. Because they're not really praying. They're not really caring about the house. you will be glad you're in this house. You better rejoice you're in this house. Amen. Amen. And that you serve a faithful God. And it says, he will what? Establish you. You know what establish means? I'm settled. My life is not rocky. I'm not sometimes up, sometimes down. Sometimes level to the ground. No. Established. How many want your finances established? How many want your mind established? Praise God. How much your body established? Now in and out of hospitals, almost dead. Somebody shout, established. established. He will establish and guard you from the evil one. Somebody say guard. What does the word guard mean? To protect. Somebody say God is my protector. When you wake up, you should be thanking God. Father, I thank you and I praise you for being my protector. Father, you are faithful. Fiercely loyal to me. You ain't going to let the devil get me. I trust you. The Bible says in the book of um, Psalms, feed on his faithfulness. What? Feed on his faithfulness. You feed on his faithfulness when you acknowledge that he's a faithful God, that he's fiercely loyal. And then you see how he does wonders for you. Amen. He guards you. He protects you. He looks out for you. When the plots of men are against you, he shows you where Satan's coming. He says, go around the devil. We've seen it over and over again. The hand of the Lord in our lives, protecting us. Because he's what? Faithful. He will guard you from the evil one. Don't be afraid of the devil. Just reverence the Lord. And let his faithfulness flow in your life. Mm, Jesus, this is good. It's number four. I changed the order. So this is number four now, right? Am I correct? Okay. God is so faithful, I mean, so loyal to you, that if you are disloyal, he will still remain loyal. He still remains loyal. God is so faithful to you that if you are disloyal, he still remains loyal. How many of you have been disloyal to the Lord? <laughs> Every hand should be up in this joint. Oh, do we have lies up in here? Should I cast out liars? Cast out demons? The demon of lying? How many of you have been disloyal to the Lord? Unfaithful. Unholy. No, <laughs> I feel like one of those unholy. Unrighteous. It, oh, anybody seen that, that um, new um, um, meme? Video meme? When the guy's telling everybody's going to hell, the preacher's saying everybody's going to hell? You're going to hell. My wife's going to hell. My kid's going to hell. And he, and he, and he takes her to the drummer playing. Stop playing. You're going to hell. I was like, what in the world is going on? Yo, that thing, that joint was crazy. Oh, man. I'd be having a good laugh at home. Praise God. I was like, yo. 2 Timothy 
It's a powerful scripture. I praise God about this all the time. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I think the King James says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. It's very powerful. This is how fiercely loyal God is to you. When you mess up, he doesn't mess up. When you fail, he doesn't fail. When you turn your back on him, he doesn't turn his back on you. Other translations, you know that part says, he remains faithful. Other translations, like the NIV says, he cannot disown himself. He cannot what? Disown himself. Another translation says, he cannot be false to himself. That gives me a lesson. Every time we're unfaithful, we're disowning who we are and we're being false to ourselves. We're not being true to who we are. How can you be the righteous of God in Christ Jesus and live in sin? You're being false to yourself. You're disowning who you are. How can you be a new creation in Christ and still doing old things? You are disowning yourself. You're being false to yourself. You know, so many people say, I'm the most realist, realist, realist. You ain't the realist nothing. You're false. You're fake. Michael and Gabriel looking at you like, fake. <laughs> yeah, you're the righteous of God. Jesus got you. Got that blood and mercy for you. But my nigga, you're fake. <laughs> That's my version. He cannot disown himself. God's not going to change character because you change character. That's how loyal he is first to himself and then to us. We should, the Bible says, be imitators as dear children of your father. Learn how to be faithful like God. Matter of fact, he gave you the power to do it. You know how? Because the Bible says the fruit of the spirit is what? Faithfulness. We usually stop at love, joy, and peace. No, there's more fruit of the spirit. Goodness, kindness, faithfulness, loyalty. There's another one called self-control. Men, sometimes when the devil's trying to tempt you, look at yourself and say, control yourself. Woman, when the devil's tempting you, look at yourself and say, control yourself. Yeah. Parents, look at your children when they cop on a plea and saying, I can't. Control yourself. You don't need 20 sandwiches. Stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> now, if there's something medical, you need to check it out. But you know it's the flesh or if it's medical, especially during the pandemic. All your parents were complaining. I was laughing. Every parent was complaining. Everywhere on TV, on the social media, in church. Yo, what is going on? All the stocks are going in two days. Because they were bored. And boredom causes people just to eat or watch television. But sometimes you got to tell your kids, control yourself. Because if you don't tell them this now, guess what happens? When they get older, they have issues with health, sex, relationships with other people. Control your temper. Now, sometimes children, anybody here, you see a kid who has like a bad temper? Anybody ever seen that before? Yeah. Your parent, your responsibility is to deal with your kid. You don't have to beat them, punch them in the face, all that stuff. Say, son, if you don't control yourself, this is what Bishop Caesar said, his dad, because Bishop was so calm. I said, whoa, he had an anger problem? He had an anger, he said, I had an anger problem when I was younger. And my dad said, if you don't control your anger, it's going to destroy you. Control yourself. Amen. Don't disown who you are. You have the power to control yourself. So God is so faithful, he cannot deny himself. He remains faithful. Lord, we just thank you for remaining faithful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, dad. If you never had a, if you never had a loyal dad, you have one now. He's God the Father. His name is Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim. He is your daddy. And he is faithful to you. If you had a faithful father and he was a good example, praise God. God is like that, but even better than that. God is faithful. Now, um, you know, I've had my little, my little, black people love saying little, 
on my little weight struggle and stuff like that. I would be a liar to say God is not faithful to me. The amount of dreams people have had in my church, outside my church, to encourage me, the things that God has given me, the grace, I would be a fool to say God has been faithful to help me stay healthy and stay alive. If I died, is no fault but my own. Nobody's fault but my own. I'm like, my God, how many dreams do people I have? And, and God, I hate to say this this way, but God plays good cop, bad cop with me. Anybody, does he do that with you too? So there'll be a whole bunch of dreams. Yo, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. Whole bunch of dreams. You're skinny, you're skinny, you're skinny. <laughs> what is God doing? He's doing what he did to Israel. I said before you, death and life. Choose life that you and your seed may live. If God has been warning you over and over, even in your spirit, that's his faithfulness. He's like, get it together! In this book, Divine Revelation of Hell, Jesus went to one, he was taking this prophetess on a tour of hell, tell my people that this place does exist. He said, I, I even have children who don't believe this place exists, but it does exist. And he said, he showed her, she said it was so, and anyway, that book is scary, Divine Revelation of Hell. You want to be scared for October 31st? Don't go to the movies. Read that book. <laughs> You'll be scared. <laughs> Trust me. Anybody read that book? Yeah. Anybody was scared when they finished reading it? Yeah. I said, the fear of the Lord in my life, like 40, 60%. <laughs> Put it this way. You live in sin? Just read that book. You'll be good. <laughs> you won't be living in sin no more. Listen, she went, he went to a cage, and one person, they actually turned, when they saw the Lord, they turned away in a corner with shame. Other people say, let me out, let me out. Jesus said to one person, judgment is set. She said he was crying. Jesus was crying. But he said, judgment is set. Another person, I think maybe it was that one who was screaming, let me out. He says, why didn't you listen? And he reminded the person how I came to you over and over and over again, but you wouldn't listen. Is that what the Lord, now we're not going to hell, thank God we're saved, because we receive salvation, but when, you, when it comes to standing before the judgment seat of Christ and rewards given or taken away, will the Lord say to you, why didn't you listen? Will he say to you, why didn't you listen? I came to you over in my faithfulness, I kept pleading with you, I kept pleading with you. Why? Will he say that to you? You don't want that, do you? So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, listen. Do the Beyonce voice. Listen. <laughs> is that one of her songs? Listen. Listen. Even Beyonce told you, listen. <laughs> you need the Holy Ghost. Beyonce said, listen. The, the, the Old Testament says, hearken to his voice. Old school language. Listen. Put your rebellion down at his feet. Paul said this, Romans 12, 1. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to him, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed in your mind. Lay your rebellion down. Say, Lord, I lay my rebellion down. I choose you over and over again. Sometimes you're gonna wake up you're gonna, and, and, the, and, the, and the social media and the TV's gonna be calling you and the Spirit of God's gonna be calling you and you, and you have to make a choice. And, and, you, and you're gonna hear God's voice say, choose me. I know many of you have heard, if not all of you, the Lord said to you, choose me. Don't choose the television. Don't choose hanging out. Don't choose the drinking. Get into the word, pray. Just open your mouth and say, hello, daddy. Good morning, father. How are you today, Jesus? Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus ain't like that. Yes, he is. Sometimes I walk in my kitchen and say, hey, Lord, good morning. How you doing today? <laughs> Do you hear him say fine? No. <laughs> but it's a relationship. 
I've heard it many times. Here's the last one. This is my favorite one. I know I beat you up a little bit, just a little. You're going to feel good after this one. This is number what? Somebody said something? I heard some giggling. Yo, you're making jokes about me back there? <laughs> this is number six. This is number six, guys? All right. God is so loyal. This is some good news, guys. You're going to, leave on a, you're going to be shouting on this one. That he has set you before his face forever. Hallelujah. Is Pastor, Pastor Patrick the only one hallelujah. shouting hallelujah? Is Christopher the only one shouting hallelujah? God is so loyal that he has set you before his face forever. Hallelujah. I realize you guys don't understand kingdom things. I'm going to read it one more time and then I'll explain to you why you should be shouting. Some of you will get it. If you think about all the movies you've seen with kings and their courts. God is so loyal that he has set you before his face forever. How many of you have seen any of those European movies with a king or a queen? Raise your hand. How many of you have seen when someone has been condemned, what happens to them? Before they get their head cut off, what happens? They get dragged off. Or they get a hood put over their head. What is that saying? You no longer have the privilege of seeing the king's face. You no longer have the privilege of being in the sovereign's presence. You're done with. Goodbye. Goodbye. And either your head is cut off or you're thrown in the prison, in the dungeon. Until you die. Or until the king says, let him out. So when the Bible says, I've set you before my face forever. That means God is saying, I'm so fiercely loyal to the church, to my sons and to my daughters, that I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. And I'm never going to turn my back on you. Can we shout about that now? Amen. Because he could turn his back and say, I don't want to see you no more. He could say, you cannot come into my presence. This is why when the Lord said what I said to me, and I told you this many times, when I was in my bed, bedroom, I think making my bed, and I heard his voice so clear. Prayerlessness is wasted access. You get to see my face. You get to face my face under the new covenant because of the blood of Jesus. And you ain't praying. You're just wasting this great benefit I've given you. Every day you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you don't realize you are acknowledging several things. That I literally have access to his presence and I have access to his face. I'm set before his face forever. God is looking at you forever. He didn't put a hood over your head and say, drag him out. That means, watch this, you're a big deal in heaven. Somebody shout, I'm a big deal. And if you're involved with anybody that's making you a small deal, dismiss them. Because you're not in line with heaven. So I know you haven't been sent from heaven. Psalm 41, 12. This is the scripture. Oh, I didn't even write it down. Doggone it. <laughs> Psalm 12, I'm writing it all that means. Can somebody pull it up? Or somebody has it up already? Psalm 41, 12. Anybody have it? I got it. Thank you. Oh, I took it. It went. Oh, okay. Yo, what's going on here, man? Keeps. 
Oh, so you touch it? I got yeah. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. Verse 13, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. This is um, David talking. He's talking about his enemies and what he wants, you know, how God has helped him and been faithful to him. And he said, you're upholding me because of my integrity, but he says, you set me before your face forever. Um, so I said, well, this is just a blessing of, of, of David. No, uh, many times the, the things that David speaks or praise God's about, it also applies to you under the new covenant or is applying to Jesus, the head of the church. Um, actually, I, there's a lesson that I failed to teach. And I forgot to forgive me many, many years ago. Um, he wanted me to teach on, um, basically compare, I want you to go and teach, he opened my eyes, I want you to compare David to the church. And there's so many things that relate to David and the church because it relates to David and Jesus. And um, one of the things he told me, he says, the first thing you'll notice when, I, when, when, when we encountered David, all right, he sent the prophet to David's house. Guys, you remember that story? And then he went to the brothers and said, said them all stand before me. So all seven brothers stood before him. The father didn't bring out um, David, Jesse. And he said, oh, surely the Lord's anointed. But it wasn't him. And then he said, you have another son? He said, yeah, when, so bring him here. He said, the Lord's anointed. But do you remember what was said to the prophet before he went? He said, I rejected Saul from being king. But I have chosen for myself another king. And the Lord said, what's the first thing you see in Ephesians? One. I said, oh my God. We have been chosen before the foundation of the world in him. He says, that's you guys and David. And then he showed me all this other stuff about us and David. I said, oh my God. Anyway. So when David says this, this applies to you too. Because the Bible says we're sons of the prophet. David was a prophet. So we're sons of David, like Jesus is the son of David. You see that? Also, the Bible says on the new covenant that I will give you the sure mercies of David. That was a promise to the Messiah, Jesus, where his body is the same promise to us. The sure what? Mercies of David. And so when you see David say, you have set me before yourself forever, that same truth is for you. God has set you before himself forever. And that's why Paul comes and says what? He says he will never leave you nor forsake you. That we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. He's not going to be your helper sometimes. He's your helper what? Always. What did Jesus say before he went? He said, lo, I am with you what? Always. What did Jesus say to his disciples before he went about the Holy Spirit? He said, the Holy Spirit, the paraclotos, the helper, has been with you, but is there coming a time He's going to be in you. And what did he end it with? Forever. Go read it. He's going to be in you forever. The Bible says you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise forever. So we serve a forever God, a fierce Lord God. And he says our status before him will never change. Isn't that good news? Come on, lift your hands and thank you. Now, the clapping was nice, but I said, lift your hands and thank you. <laughs> God, you are amazing. Fiercely loyal. Hallelujah.